25th, 2016. Okay, so we'll start with the homage to the Buddha three times. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Okay, good morning everybody. <clears throat> so today we come to Sutta number 43 in the Majjhima Nikaya. This is called the Mahavedala Sutta. And in the title, the exact meaning of the word Vedala is really not understood well. So when we give it the English title, The Greatest Series of Questions and Answers, that's based more on the actual content or form or structure of the Sutta, rather than as an attempt to translate the word Vedala. And we know, well, we could see that there are two Vedala suttas in the Majjhima This is the greater or longer one. And we had already done the shorter Mahavedala sutta. So it seems to me that there are some, let us say that there could have been some overlapping or confusion even in the assignment of certain portions to one Vedala rather than the other Vedala Sutta. So in the Mahavedala Sutta, the greater series, there is a section with a discussion of what is called the meditative attainment of the cessation of perception and feeling. But it seems that part of the explanation of that attainment is missing from the Maha version. And we find it in the shorter version. <laughs> so it seems or probably or perhaps originally that shorter portion, or that portion on the cessation of perception and feeling that's now in the shorter version was originally in the longer version or maybe all of it was in the shorter version, but that would have made the shorter version bigger than the, <laughs> than the longer version. <laughs> so their names would have had to be changed. Anyway, when we come to that section in the Mahavedala Sutta, we'll probably also have to refer back to the shorter Vedala Sutta, which we had discussed maybe two or three years ago. So unless everybody's memory, recollection of that sutta is very clear, it would be useful to go back and look at it. But we won't get to that this week. Okay, both of these Vedala suttas, the way I look at them, seem to be what I would call, or to represent a transitional phase in which the early Buddha's teaching, as we find in you know, discourses in the Sangyutta Nikaya, and Guttara Nikaya, most of the Majjhima Nikaya, is moving in the direction that will culminate in the Abhidhamma. In fact, we find the expression Abhidhamma as it's used in the suttas is referring not to a distinct body of text or literature corresponding to the Abhidhamma Bhitaka. But when the text uses the word Abhidhamma, it's always referring to discussions amongst the monks. So it seems originally the word Abhidhamma had the meaning of a discussion about the Dhamma, in which the Dhamma is being treated somewhat in with greater technical detail and precision 
than we find in the general discourses of the Buddha. And so this Mahavedala Sutta, as we'll see, seem, il illustrates that characteristic of being a discussion between monks about the Dhamma and dealing with fine, subtle, technical points that we don't find in, you know, the usual discourses of the Buddha himself. And so this discourse takes place as a discussion between the Venerable Sariputta and the Venerable Mahakotita. The Venerable Sariputta, of course, is known as the chief disciple of the Buddha and the disciple whose specialization was panya, or wisdom. And historically, through many uh, traditions of early Buddhism, Sariputta is connected with the foundations of the Abhidhamma. So we can't believe that the Abhidhamma texts that we have now were actually written or composed by Sariputta, but it's quite possible that Sariputta started this tradition of taking the statements of the Buddha and then explaining them in this very detailed, analytical manner. And then as Sariputta's own pupils learned the method of, an, of rigorous analysis from Sariputta, they would have started to apply that method to a larger and larger body of material until these discussions amongst them eventually crystallized in the formation of texts that came to be called Abhidharma texts. And the other monk involved in this discussion is named Mahakotita, and often we find Mahakotita engaged in discussions with Sariputta, usually on subtle points of Dharma. And the Buddha declared Mahakotita to be the foremost disciple in regard to a certain branch of, um, of learning that is called the analytical knowledges. In Pali, the word is pati sambiddha. And so there are said to be four patisambhita, four analytical knowledges. One is the analytical knowledge of the meaning. A word atta, which also is explained as having the meaning of results or fruits. Results or fruits fruits in the sense of the effects or consequences, not analytical knowledge of different types of apples, grapes, oranges, <laughs> dragon fruits. So we have analytical knowledge of atta, which means meaning or results, then there's Dhamma Pati Sambhita, which is the analytical knowledge of the doctrine. That's Dhamma as doctrine, but the commentaries also explain Dhamma here as causes. So these first two analytical knowledges go together. Analytical knowledge of effects, analytical knowledge of causes analytical knowledge of meanings, 
analytical knowledge of dhammas or doctrines. Okay, then the third analytical knowledge is analytical knowledge of terminology. That is, knowing and understanding the right terms and expressions to use when expounding the Dhamma. And then the fourth analytical knowledge is the anal analytical knowledge, it's hard to find a suitable English word to represent this, to translate this. The word is patibana. The meaning seems to be well, I've been using the rendering for this ingenuity. And the way it's explained, it is the ability to use the three former types of knowledge, the knowledge of meanings, the knowledge of doctrines, the knowledge of terminology, to be able to utilize those three in order to expound and explain the Dhamma. So you can see that this analytical knowledge goes very closely with the type of enterprise that's undertaken in the Abhidhamma, in which concepts are taken precisely defined, and then all of their implications are drawn out and woven together. Okay, and the disciple of the Buddha who is said to have excelled in that sphere of competence was Mahakotita. And it's these two monks that that participate in the, dis in the discussion that makes up the Mahavedala Sutta. Okay, so let us now go to the Sutta itself. So the Sutta takes place first, it mentions that at the time the Buddha was dwelling in Savati at the Natapindika's monastery. Okay, so then one evening the Venerable Mahakotita came out from his meditation and went to the Venerable Sariputta and they exchanged greetings. And then he sat down and then he spoke to the Venerable Sariputta. And he asked the question, but we have to understand when Mahakotita is asking questions to Venerable Sariputta, it's not that he doesn't know the answers himself, but he's answer, asking these questions in order to draw out answers from somebody who is like a master of the doctrine like Sariputta, probably to find out simply how Sariputta would answer these questions, and perhaps also with the idea that these, this discourse will be remembered and then transmitted to his own disciples so they could learn the explanations given by Sariputta. Okay, so first he comes to Sariputta and he says, one who is dupanyo, which is translated here, unwise. One who is unwise. With reference to what is this said, one who is unwise. And the word translated here, unwise, is dupanya. Yeah, the word panya 
is the adjective form based on panya, which means wisdom, and the prefix dur sometimes means bad, sometimes uncomfortable, like the word dukkha, suffering. Okay, so this is somebody with, without wisdom. We might even say foolish or s even stupid for dupanya. But here, politely, it's translated as unwise. Okay, so then Sariputta answers and he says, one does not The actual Pali would be rendered, one does not understand, one does not understand. And so the Pali, I'm sorry to be putting so much Pali in. You see, we come to a certain problem in translation Okay, there's a noun, panya, which we translate as wisdom, and this is explained on the basis of the verb pajanati. And this verb, it's based on the root, the Pali root, nya, which in Sanskrit, is nya, jnya, which means to know. And it occurs in many verbs in relating to different types of knowledge. Okay, so when we have pajanati, it has the prefix p plus the verb janati. And so we translate this as to understand but the verb pajanati is the basis for the noun panya, which we translate as wisdom. And so we have a disconnect between, in English, between the verb and the noun, whereas in the original language, in Pali, that connection is immediately apparent. If we translate panya as understanding, then it seems to be like a very ordinary, mundane quality. Like he has an understanding of biology, he has an understanding of economics. No, I'm mistaken about that. Nobody has an understanding of economics. <laughs> he understands, he has an understanding of computer programming. Whereas panya in Buddhism means a higher type of understanding, you know, penetrative spiritual underst understanding of spiritual truths. And so to render the verb, I don't know, maybe you could say he wisens up, he wisens up. <laughs> to wisen, but that sounds a little strange. We don't use, speak that way often. So that's why in translation, I don't remember whether it was Venerable Nyanamoli or myself. I think it was my, that I did this myself. We put the adverb wisely in front of understand to make the connection with panya, wisdom. So in this case, it's the negation. One does not wisely understand one does not wisely understand. That is why it is said, one who is unwise. And what doesn't one wisely understand? One does not wisely understand. This is suffering. This is the origin of suffering. This is the cessation of suffering. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. Okay, so we start off with the negative side, with the absence of panya. 
the absence of wise understanding or wisdom. Okay, now next we come to the um, positive side where we're dealing with the question of who is wise and how is one wise? And so here the question, the, the Mahakotita brings up the question, first he says, one who is wise, one who is wise. So here the adjective is panyava. So the suffix va means one who has, one who possesses, and what is possessed is panya, wisdom. So one who possesses wisdom is called wise. Okay, so the question is, with reference to what is it said panyava, one who has wisdom? one who is wise. And then the answer comes pajana, in Pali it's simply pajanati, pajanati, which is translated here, one wisely understands, one wisely understands. That is why it is said, one who is wise. And what does one wisely understand? Again, the answer is, in terms of the Four Noble Truths, one wisely understands this is suffering, this is its origin, this is its cessation, this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. And so when it is said, one wisely, when it is said, one who is wise, that is said with reference to one who wisely understands. Okay, so this little exchange shows us the sphere of wisdom according to early Buddhism. So the sphere or domain of wisdom is the Four Noble Truths. And according to the commentary, sometimes, as I've said before, I don't completely go along with the commentaries. So the commentary here says that one who possesses wisdom in this sense is one starting from the person on the stage of the path of stream entry up to the stage of, I think it's one on the path to arahatship. No, it, it just says that the lowest type of person to be described as wise is the person on the path of stream entry. So we'd go from the person on the path of stream entry up to and including the arahat. And I think this is said on the basis of a number of passages which speak about the stream enterer or one on the path of stream entry as one who gains the eye of Dharma or who makes the breakthrough to the Dharma. And what one sees when one gains the eye of Dharma, what one penetrates to or breaks through to is the understanding of the Four Noble Truths. So up until the time one reaches the path of stream entry, we can have an intellectual or conceptual knowledge of the Four Noble Truths, but we don't actually have the panya or wisdom of the Four Noble Truths. Even when we are doing insight meditation, vipassana meditation, we'll be gaining some understanding of the truth of dukkha, because we can see impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, non-self to some extent. We can see how craving is bringing about dukkha, suffering or discontent, unsatisfactoriness. 
but one doesn't have what I would call the global or comprehensive Four Noble uh, knowledge of the Four Noble Truths until one reaches the path of stream entry. Of course, it's at the path of stream entry that the mind turns away from all conditioned phenomena and actually sees and experiences Nibbana, which is the cessation of suffering, the third noble truth. And it's when one sees the actual cessation of suffering that one can then look back at all conditioned phenomena, everything included in the five aggregates, and understand all this is really dukkha, bound up with suffering and unsatisfactoriness. Okay, so it's when one understands in this global or comprehensive way the Four Noble Truths that one can be said or called wise. That's according to the commentarial explanation. But I think, as I said, sometimes the commentary is being too restrictive, and maybe we could say one who even has a conceptual, a correct and accurate conceptual knowledge of the Four Noble Truths that can be called wise in a broad sense. Okay, now we move into the next section of the sutta. And here the question is brought up, but first it said, consciousness, consciousness, it is said, friend, with reference to what is consciousness said. Okay, now when we look at this in English translation, It looks like a completely different topic from the topic of wisdom. But if one knows, if one is reading in Pali, or even if one knows Pali terminology, we can see that the relationship between these two sections is actually fairly close because the noun that's rendered consciousness in Pali and the verb on which Consciousness, <coughs> vijnana is based, is vijanati. So you can see between panya and vijnana, they're both formed on the basis of the same verbal root, the snya or jnya, and the verbs look very close. The difference is simply pujanati, which is one understands the basis for panya, wisdom. And here the verb is vijanati. We could say one cognizes, one cognizes, and that's the basis for wisdom, uh, uh, for conscious, for vijnana, rendered consciousness. And so, Mahakotita is trying to find out the distinction between these two words, which are very different in English, wisdom and consciousness, but in Pali, very close together, panya, pajanati, and vijnana, vijanati. So it's almost like, almost like a fine hair's verbally, just a fine hair distinction between them. Okay, so Sariputta,
gives the answer, it cognizes, it cognizes vijanati, vijanati. That is why consciousness is said. And then he goes on, and this seems a, somewhat strange to me. He says, what does it cognize? It cognizes pleasant, it cognizes painful, it cognizes neither painful nor pleasant. So it cognizes, it cognizes, that is why consciousness is said. I find this a little bit puzzling and perplexing because it would seem that if you're going to say, what does cog consciousness cognize? To answer just in terms of feeling seems very limited. And I checked on my friend, Venerable Analio. He has this very big book <laughs> called The Comparative Study Between the Suttas of the Majjhima and their counterparts or parallels from other early Buddhist traditions. And so he did a comparison between this sutta and the Chinese translation Madhyama Agama version of the sutta. And in the Madhyama Agama version of the sutta, it says, what does consciousness cognize? Then it gives the six sense objects, which makes better sense to me that it cognizes visible forms, sounds, odors, flavors, tactile objects, and mental objects. Because in many other suttas, when the question is raised, what is consciousness, then the, the answer is given that there are these six types of consciousness, eye consciousness, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind consciousness. So we have six types of consciousness. Each type of consciousness has its own distinctive object, and so the answer, what does it cognize, of what is consciousness conscious, the reasonable answer seems to be that the six types of sense objects. Yeah, failing will be brought in. Yeah. <laughs> okay, maybe so. Or maybe it was the influence of the next section that sort of impacted on this section and led to, uh, to that answer rather than the six sense objects. Anyway, let us continue. Okay, now we get into a rather subtle part of the discussion. Really sort of moving very much in the direction of Abhidhamma. Okay, so here we have the question is raised, wisdom and consciousness, friend, are these sta states conjoined, that's joined together, uh, associated, or disjoined, you know, utterly separate? And is it possible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them. Okay, so that, those are the questions. Then Sariputta answers, wisdom and consciousness, friend, these states, and he's using the word dhamma in that plural sense, of mental factors. Wisdom and consciousness, friend, these states are conjoined, not disjoined, and it is impossible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them. Okay, this doesn't mean that there is no difference between them. 
As we'll see, there is a difference between them. The two have different functions, different characteristics and different functions. But in order to describe the difference between them, you can't pull them apart and say, this is wisdom, this is consciousness, wisdom occurs here, consciousness occurs here. They're always associated. And there's a later Pali work called the Melinda Panha, the questions of the King Melinda, in which it's a, an imaginary dialogue between a Greek king, or king of Greek descent, ruling over Bactria, the Gandhara, that's now Pakistan, and the Buddhist monk Nagasena, in which the monk Nagasena, he's explaining how the Buddha was able to distinguish different mental factors which are joined together. And he compares this to the way that different mental factors are joined together to a soup which is made with using different spices or maybe like an Indian curry which is made with turmeric, cumin, chili powders, mustard seed. What are some of the other spices? Masala. Is masala a distinct spice? Fenugreek. Yeah, okay, you have all of these different spices and used to flavor the curry, the curry sauce. And so when we eat or taste the curry sauce, you know, it's very difficult to distinguish this part of the taste of the curry sauce is due to the cumin, this part is due to the turmeric, this part, well, you could tell what's coming from the chili pepper. <laughs> this is due to the fenugreek, this is due to the masala. Because they're all blended together, but maybe a, fi a very experienced cook tasting the curry sauce can tell this much is due to the fenugreek, this much is due to the cumin powder, and he'll know to get the ideal sauce how much more cumin you have to use or how much more turmeric. And so what the Buddha has done in analyzing these different mental states that occur conjoined is similar to distinguishing the different spices used to prepare a curry sauce. Okay, so Sariputta says, wisdom and consciousness are conjoined, not disjoined, and it's impossible to separate them in order to describe the difference between them. Then he says, for what one wisely understands, that one cognizes. Whenever there is understanding or wisdom, there's also consciousness present. And what one cognizes, that one wisely understands. This has to be taken in the sense that when there's an experience of wisdom occurring, then when one is conscious of that, cognizing, cognizing it, then wisdom is also present. It doesn't mean that whenever one is conscious, then one has wisdom. <laughs> In that case, everybody in the world, who's co every, except those in a deep coma, we would say have wisdom. And since they have wisdom, and wisdom understands the Four Noble Truths, it means everybody understands the Four Noble Truths. In that case, I could turn off my computer, um, finish my drink, pack my bag, and go back to my room. And since I'll be a little tired from cognizing the Four Noble Truths all the time, I could <laughs> go to sleep, <laughs> fade out from consciousness. And then as soon as I wake up again, then I'll be 
knowing and penetrating the Four Noble Truths. <laughs> so it shouldn't take it to mean that whenever one is conscious, one has wisdom, but rather it's saying, in an experience of wisdom, in an experience where wisdom is present, then consciousness, one is cognizing that of which, that which one is understanding. Okay, so that's, so then he concludes, that is why these states are conjoined, not disjoined, and it is impossible to separate each of these states from the other in order to describe the difference between them. So if you just read this superficially, you might think that he's saying that there is no difference between wisdom and consciousness. But then Mahakotita raises the next question, which shows that there is a difference between them. He says, what is the difference between wisdom and consciousness? These states that are conjoined, not disjoined. And then Sariputta answers, the difference between wisdom and consciousness is this. Wisdom is to be developed and consciousness is to be fully understood. I guess this is self-evident. This No? What? No, I'm only joking when I say that. Yeah, this is a, a bit obscure. And so, to understand this, we have to, I think, relate it to a particular structure that the Buddha develops in regard to the Four Noble Truths. You see, we're getting quite technical here. And that is why I didn't take this sutta as we were going through the Muchima Nikaya in sequence, but I kept it. In fact, I wasn't going to take this at all, thinking it was too technical. But then, I don't even see her here. It was Suki Park, and Carolyn Cronin said, take it, take it, take it. So I said, okay. Okay, so regarding these four truths, and we find this even in the first sermon of the Buddha, when he, when he first explained the Four Noble Truths, he didn't just declare or announce the Four Noble Truths, but if you look at the whole discourse, he says with regard to each truth, there is a particular function or task that has to be fulfilled. So regarding dukkha, the task is full understanding, to fully understand it. And what is the truth of dukkha? What does it, when you reduce it to its simplest, most basic terms, what does it come down to? The five aggregates, right. And the origin, what is the origin of dukkha, according to the first sermon? Right, it's craving.
And so what is the function regarding the first, the second noble truth? Right, to abandon it. And then the cessation of dukkha, what does it really amount to, ultimately? Right, it's Nibbana. And then what is the function regarding that? Right, to realize it, to attain it, to experience it. And then the path, of course, is the Noble Eightfold Path. And what is the function regarding the path? Right, exactly. To develop it. Okay, so the statement that we have in the sutta here, the way I see it, has to be interpreted in terms of this particular, call it a template, in that consciousness, where does consciousness fit in in relation to the Four Noble Truths? Exactly. It fits in number one because consciousness is one of the five aggregates, the fifth aggregate. And so because the five aggregates should be fully understood and consciousness is one of the five aggregates, so consciousness should be fully understood. Okay, now in terms of this diagram or template, where does wisdom fit in? This is getting a little technical. Right, wisdom, and where in four does it fit in? Exactly. Now we have a modern Mahakotita amongst us. <laughs> right. So wisdom is, in a way, synonymous with the path factor of right view. And so, since the Noble Eightfold Path is to be developed, this means that right view, of course, is to be developed, and panya, wisdom, is a kind of synonym of the higher right view. And so one develop, when one is developing the Noble Eightfold Path, one is developing wisdom. And when one is developing wisdom, wisdom is what will understand the five aggregates, and wisdom will understand consciousness. Okay, maybe at this point we'll pause and see if there are any questions. Does anybody feel that their head is exploding because of all of these techniques? <laughs> okay, somebody had some question? So, uh, you said uh, wisdom will understand consciousness. Um, so. Are you saying they are separate? So the consciousness is fits into the number one dukkha, but how about number two and number three? Uh, consciousness is is not there. Does not exist in understanding the craving. Not understand how to abandon it. How, how understand is realizing it. The consciousness does not use. We don't use consciousness in number two and number three? 
When you just said, I, maybe I, I'm misunderstood. I just want to know uh, the wisdom fits in relation to the four tasks. You're talking about wisdom in the path, in that number four yeah. path. Yeah. And number one, dukkha, is the consciousness. And how about and dukkha, I, I, I don't say that dukkha is equivalent to consciousness. What I said is that consciousness is one of the five aggregates, and the sutta explains dukkha, well, we translate suffering, is ultimately the five aggregates. And so the five aggregates are to be understood, to be fully understood. Yes, and that is, I'm sorry, maybe I just simplifies my question. So in other words, to understand dukkha,